Disclaimer. This is an audiobook recording performed for entertainment purposes through fair use. I do not claim any of the texts being read to be mine or written by me. This is Memoirs of a Teenage Amnesiac by Gabriel Zevin. Above all, mine is a love story. And like most love stories, this one involves chance, gravity, and a dash of head trauma. It began with a coin toss. The coin came tails up. I was heads. Had it gone the other way, there might not be a story at all. Just a chapter or a sentence in a book whose greater theme had yet to be determined. Maybe this chapter would have had the faintest whisper of love about it. But maybe not. Sometimes a girl just needs to lose. I was. Chapter 1. If things had been different, I'd be called Natalia or Natasha, and I'd have a Russian accent and chapped lips year-round. Maybe I'd even be a street kid who'd trade you just about anything for a pair of blue jeans. But I am not Natalia or Natasha, because at six months old I was delivered from Kratikovo, Moscow, Oblast, to Brooklyn, New York. I don't remember the trip or even having lived in Russia. What I know about my orphanhood is limited to what I've been told by my parents and then what they were told, which was sketchy at best. A weak old baby girl was found in an empty typewriter case in the second-to-last pew of an Eastern Orthodox church. Was the case a clue to my biological father's profession? Did the church mean my mother was devout? I'll never know, so I choose not to speculate. Besides, I hate orphan stories. They're all the same, but most books are bursting with them anyway. You start to think maybe the whole world must be an orphan. I can't remember a time when I didn't know I was adopted. There was never a dramatic, we have something to tell you, talk. My adoption was simply just another fact, like having dark hair or no siblings. I knew I was adopted even before I truly knew what it meant. Understanding adoption requires a basic understanding of sex something I would not have until the third grade when Gina Papradatis brought her grandparents' disturbingly dog-eared copy of The Joys of Sex to school. She passed it around at lunch, and while most everyone was gagging with the realization that their parents had did that to make them so much hair, and the people in the drawings were not one bit joyful, I felt perfectly fine, even a little smug. I might be adopted, but at least my parents hadn't degraded them like that for my sake. Now, you're probably wondering why they didn't do it the old-fashioned way. Not that it's any of your business, but they tried for a while, without getting anywhere. After about a year, Mom and Dad decided, rather than investing about a billion dollars on fertility treatments that might not work anyway, it would be better to spend that money helping some poor sob story like me. This is why you are not, at this moment, holding in your hands the inspiring true story of a Kratovan orphan named Natalia, who, all things being different, might be named Nancy or Naomi. Truth is, I rarely think about any of this. I'm only telling you now because, in a way, I was born to be an amnesiac. I have always been required to fill in the blanks. But I'm definitely getting ahead of myself. When I heard about my, for lack of a better term, accident, my best friend Will, who I'd completely forgotten at the time, wrote me a letter. It didn't come immediately because he had slipped it into the sleeve of a CD disc. He had inherited an old battered typewriter from his great uncle Desmond, who had supposedly been a war correspondent, though Will was unclear which war that had been. There was a dent in the carriage return and Will theorized that it might have been from a ricocheting bullet. In any case, Will liked composing letters on the typewriter, even when it would have been much easier to send an email or call the person on the phone. Incidentally, the boy wasn't anti-technology, he just had an appreciation for things people had forgotten. I should tell you that the following dispatch, while being the only record of events leaving up to my accident, does not convey much of Will's personality. It was completely unlike him to be so formal, stiff, even boring. 
You do get some sense of him from his footnotes, but half of you won't bother to look at those anyway. I know I didn't. At the time, I felt about footnotes nearly the same way I did about orphan stories. Chief, the first thing I want you to know is that I remember everything. And the second thing is that I'm probably the most honest person in the world. I realize you can't trust anyone who says that they're honest. And knowing this, I wouldn't normally say something like that about myself. I'm only telling you now because it's something I feel you should know. In an attempt to make myself useful to you, I have assembled a timeline of events leading up to your accident, which you may or may not find helpful, but you will find below. 6.36 p.m. Naomi Porter and William Landsman, co-editor of the National Award winning 1. Honorable Mention, NSPA, Thomas Purdue County Day School Yearbook, leave the office of the Phoenix, 2. While school starts after Labor Day for mere mortals, it starts in August for football players, marching band, and us, and bird watchers. We had been planning to photograph the first meeting of the Tom Purdue Bird Watching Society the next morn. 6.45 p.m. Porter and Landsman arrive at the student parking lot. Porter realizes that they have left the camera back at the office. 6.46 p.m. Discussion. 3. We often discuss things. Others might call these arguments. Ensues regarding who should return to the office to retrieve the camera. Landsman suggests settling the matter with a coin toss. Four. Poses a series of interesting philosophical questions, which I'm still pondering, but I'm not prepared to discuss at this time. A proposition which Porter accepts. Landsman says that he will be heads, but Porter states... 5. Also arguing that she should be heads. Landsman concedes, as oft happens. Landsman flips the coin and Porter loses. 6.53 p.m. Landsman drives home. Porter returns to the Phoenix. 7.02 p.m. Approximately. 6. Unfortunately, from this point forward, I've had to rely on the reports of others, like your dad or that cat, James. Porter arrives at the Phoenix office, where she retrieves the camera. 7.05 p.m., approximately, Porter falls down the exterior front steps of the school. Porter strikes her head on the bottom step, but manages to hold on to the camera. 7. The camera was an Orniatic 8000G Pro, which we had just purchased for $3,599.99 tax-free plus shipping, using the entire proceeds of last year's wrapping paper fundraiser. The staff at the Phoenix thanks you. Porter is discovered by one James Larkin. 8. I don't know what he was doing there that day. As I mentioned to you, I am always available to answer any other questions that may arise. I remain your faithful servant, William B. 9. I imagine you've also forgotten that B stands for Blake, although William Blake is probably my least favorite poet, and I only feel 50% about him as an artist. The woman responsible for my name, a.k.a. my mother, will also be your AP English teacher, a.k.a. Mrs. Landsman. Landsman. P.S. Apologies for the I key. Hopefully you figured out by now that the thing that resembles a trident is actually the letter I capitalized. There's a defect on my typewriter such that every time I capitalize the letter I, it also presses the capital letter U with it. Of course, I didn't remember any of this. Not the coin toss, not the camera. Certainly not my best friend, the vivacious William Blake Landsman. The first thing I remember was that cat, James Larkin, though I don't even know his name at the time. And I didn't remember all of James, James proper, just his voice, because my eyes were still closed. And I guess you'd call me asleep, or half asleep, like when your alarm clock goes off and you manage to ignore it for a while. You hear the radio in the shower, you smell the coffee and the toast. You know you will wake. It's just a question of when. Or of what will finally push you into the day. His voice was low and steady. I've always associated those types of voices with honesty. 
but I'm sure there are loads of low-pitched liars just waiting to take advantage of easy prey like me. Even semi-conscious, I lapsed into prejudice and decided to trust every word James said. Sir, my name is James Larkin. Unfortunately, her family is not here, but I am her boyfriend, and I am riding in this ambulance. I didn't hear anyone argue with him. Not that his tone allowed for some discussion. Someone took my hand, and I opened my eyes. It was him, although I didn't know his face. Hey there, he said softly. Welcome back. I did not stop to consider where I had been that required welcoming. I did not even ask myself why I was in an ambulance with a boy who said he was my boyfriend, but whom I did not readily recognize. As ridiculous as this might seem, I tried to smile, but I doubt if he even saw. My attempt didn't last long. The pain came. The kind of pain for which there is no analogy. The kind of pain that allows for no other thought. The epicenter was concentrated right above my left eye, but it barely mattered. The waves through the rest of my head were almost worse. My brain felt too large for my skull. I felt like I needed to throw up, but I didn't. Without having to tell him, James asked, Could someone please give her drugs? An EMT shone a light into my eyes. Not until she's been seen by a doctor. Maybe even had a CT scan. But it's terrific news that she's already up. Just five more minutes, okay, Naomi? Five more minutes until what? I asked trying to sound patient until Christmas until my head exploded sorry until we're at the hospital at this point the pain in my head was so strong I wanted to weep I probably would have too but it occurred to me that crying might make me feel worse are you positive she can't have any drugs James yelled distract her tell her a joke or something we're almost there was the EMT's annoying unhelpful reply I don't think that's going to do it, James retorted. Laughter is the best medicine, said the EMT. I believe this may have been his idea of a joke, but it did nothing for my headache. Complete and utter. James leaned in close to me. He smelled like smoke and laundry sheets left to dry in the rain. Bullshit. Would you like a joke anyway? I nodded. I really would have preferred the drugs. Well, I can only think of one, and it's not that good. Certainly not analgestic good. So, okay, this man goes to a psychiatrist and says, My wife's insane. She thinks she's a chicken. And the doctor goes, Well, why don't you commit her? And the man says, Just as he was about to reveal the punchline, a particularly impressive wave of pain pulsed through my head. My nails dug into James's palm, piercing his skin, making him bleed. I couldn't speak, so I tried to telegraph an apology with a look. No worries, James said. I can take it. He winked at me. In the emergency room, the doctor with eyes so bloodshot, they made me tired just to look at them, asked James how long I had been passed out. He replied 21 minutes. He knew exactly. He'd seen it happen. At Tom Perdue, there are these steps out front. One second she's walking down them, and then the next she's flying headfirst toward me like a meteor. Is it strange I don't remember that? I asked. Nope, said the doctor. Perfectly ordinary to forget incident-associated narratives for a time. She shined the light in my eyes, and I flinched. At some point, another doctor and nurse joined the party, although I couldn't have told you with any confidence. Nor could I recall much about them as individuals. They were an indistinct blur of pastels and white uniforms, like chalk doodles on the sidewalk in the rain. The second doctor said that she had asked me a couple of questions, generic ones, not about the incident. Your full name? Naomi Page Porter. Where do you live? Terrytown, New York. Good, Naomi, good. What year is it? Two thousand and... Two thousand? Maybe? Even as I said it, I knew it wasn't right. Because if it was 2000, I would have been 12. And I knew for sure I wasn't 12. I didn't feel 12. I felt... I couldn't give an exact number, but I knew I felt older. 17, 18. 
My body didn't feel 12. My mind didn't feel 12 either. And there was James, James proper. James looked at least 17, maybe older. I felt the same age as him, the same as him. I looked from doctor to doctor to nurse, poker faces, every one. One of the doctors said, okay, that's fine for now. Try not to worry. This, of course, made me worry. I decided that the best thing for me to do would be to go home and sleep it off. I tried to sit up in the gurney, which made my head throb even more intensely than it ever had. Whoa, Naomi, what are you doing? The nurse said. He and James gently pushed me back to a horizontal position. The doctor repeated, try not to worry. The other doctor paraphrased, really, you shouldn't worry. And they walked across the ER to the other patient. I heard the doctors muttering to each other all sorts of worries and phrases. Mild traumatic brain injury and specialists and CT scan and possible retrograde amnesia. I have a tendency to deal with things by not dealing with them at all, so instead of demanding that somebody immediately tell me what was wrong, I just listened until I couldn't anymore. Then I decided to concentrate on matters more tangible. James always said how ugly he was, but I think he might have known that he wasn't. The only bad thing someone could have said about him was that he was too skinny, but never mind that. Maybe, because I couldn't seem to remember anything else, I felt like I needed to memorize every single thing about him. His fraying white dress shirt was open, so I could see he was wearing a really old concert t-shirt. It was faded to the point where I couldn't even tell what band it was for. His boxers were sticking out over his jeans, and I could make out that they were a dark green plaid. His fingers were long and thin like the rest of him, and a few of them were smudged with black ink. His hair was damp with sweat, which made it even darker than usual. Around his neck was a single leather rope with a silver ring on it, and I wondered if the ring was mine. His collar had gotten up, half turned. I noticed the blood on his lapel. There's blood on your collar, I said. Um, it's yours, <laughs> he laughed. I laughed too, even though it made my brain beat like a heart. In the ambulance. For whatever reason, the phrase in the ambulance embarrassed me and I had to replace. In the van, you said you were my boyfriend? Mm, I hadn't known you were listening to that. He had this funny smile on his face and sort of shook his head a couple of times as if the conversation was with himself. He let go of my hand and laid it back on the gurney. No, he said. I just said you were my girlfriend so they would let me ride with you. I didn't want you to be alone. This was disappointing news, to say the least. There's a joke about amnesiacs, which always reminds me of meeting James. It's not exactly a joke, but more of a funny slogan you'd wear on a t-shirt if you were A, an amnesiac, and B, corny, and C, probably had issues in addition to amnesia. Like low self-esteem, or the need to give people too much information. Or just plain bad taste in clothes. Okay, picture a really cheap 50% polyester jersey with white font and red sleeves. Now add the words, hi, I'm an amnesiac. Have we met before? You know something funny, I said. The first thing I thought of was that you had an honest voice about you. And it turns out you were lying to me. No, no, not to you. Only to some jerk in a uniform, he corrected. If I'd been thinking at all, I would have said you were my sister. No one would have questioned that. Except me. I don't have any siblings. I tried to make a joke of it. If given the choice, I'd prefer being his imaginary girlfriend to his imaginary sisters. Are we friends, at least? No, Naomi, James said with a little smile. I can't say we are. Why not? He seemed like the odd kind of person it might be nice to be friends with. Maybe we ought to be, was all he replied. It was, and it wasn't a satisfactory answer, so I tried a different question. Before, when you were shaking your head, what were you thinking? You're really going to ask me that? You have to tell me. I might die, you know. I didn't take you for the manipulative kind. 
I closed my eyes and pretended to pass out. Oh, all right. But that's awful low, he said with a resigned laugh. I was wondering if I could get away with letting you think I was your boyfriend. And I then decided that it would definitely be wrong to do so. It wouldn't be fair. You don't even know what year it is, for God's sakes. A good relationship is not built on lies and all that crap. And, well, I was wondering if it would be wrong to kiss you. Not on the mouth, maybe on your forehead or hand. Well, I had the chance. While you were still thinking, you were mine. And I decided that it would be very, very wrong and probably uncomfortable later on. Plus, a girl like you does have a boyfriend. I interrupted. You think? James nodded. Definitely. I don't give a damn about him, mind you. But I don't want to compromise you. Or take advantage. I decided that if I ever kissed you, I'd want your permission. I'd want... At that moment, my dad walked into the ER. James had been leaning over the side of the gurney railing. But he stood up straight as a soldier to shake my dad's hand. Sir, he said. And James Larkin, I go to school with your daughter. But Dad pushed past James to get to me, and James was left with his palm in the air, and I saw the four puncture wounds of my nails from grabbing him so tight. The doctors returned then, followed by a nurse and a specialist and an orderly who began wheeling me without even bothering to tell me where I was, and then I really had to throw up, and I didn't want James to have to watch. I didn't want him to leave either. And somehow James slipped out without my seeing, which is something I would later find out he had a talent for. Once I was admitted into a room, Dad passed the time by asking me if I was okay. You okay, kid? Yes, Dad. Five seconds later, kiddo, you okay? In an amazing display of restraint, I managed to reply, yes, Dad, three more times, even though I had no earthly idea if I even was. On the fifth or sixth time, I finally snapped. Where's Mom? She was better than Dad at handling these types of situations. In the city, he said. He kept pacing the room and looking up and down the hallway. Christ, is there anyone ever going to help us? Is she working? Mom was a photographer and sometimes she had to go into the city for that. Working, Dad repeated. His head was sticking out the door like a turtle, but he pulled it back inside so that he could look at me. She's... She, Naomi, are you trying to worry me? Dad, are you screwing with me? Knowing my dad, this was not an unlikely scenario. Screwing with you? I assumed he hadn't liked my use of the word screw, though dad was not normally the type of parent who cared much about swearing. He always said that words were just words, and the only reason to ever eliminate any of them is if they were harmful, and you weren't meaning to be. Inexpressive. I figured that the anxiety of the situation might be getting to him, so I rephrased. Sorry, playing with me. Whatever. Are you screwing with me? So you can use the word screw and I can't? That doesn't seem fair, I protested. I don't give a damn if you use the word screw, Naomi, but is that what you're doing? I'm not screwing with you. Just tell me where mom is. In NYC. He sounded them out in slow motion. New York City. Yes, I know what NYC stands for, but why? She lives there since the divorce. You haven't forgotten that, have you? I'm sure you've already figured out that I had. Everyone always says how much I look like her. My mom, I mean. Which is ridiculous, because she's half Scottish and half Japanese. We both have light blue eyes, though, so I guess that accounts for the misunderstanding. No one ever says I look like my dad, which is ironic because he's actually part Russian. The rest of him is French, and all of him is Jewish, although he's not observant. All this makes everyone sound much more interesting than they are. My mom's really just a California girl, and my dad was born in D.C., and they met in college in New York City, where we all used to live until I was 11. If you're the wine-drinking type, you might have heard of them. They wrote a series of travel memoirs slash coffee table books called The Wandering Porters Do dot 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 and then fill in the blank with exotic locales of your choice, somewhere like Morocco or Tuscany. My mom took the pictures and my dad wrote the text except for the occasional footnote by my mom. Her footnotes were usually something mortifying like two. 
at an Edam cheese factory, Naomi vomited in an enormous wooden clog, or seven. Naomi was particularly fond of the schnitzel. As for my contribution, I made a series of increasingly awkward appearances in their author photo on the back jacket flap above the caption, When Not Wandering, Cassandra Miles Porter and Grant Porter live in New York City with their daughter Naomi. That's what popped in my head when Dad said they were the divorce. All those wandering Porter books and me as the kid in the back flap. In a strange way, I didn't feel like their divorce was happening to me. Certainly not the me in that moment, or the person lying in the hospital bed. It was happening to the little girl on the book jackets. I felt sad for her, but nothing for myself yet. Did it just happen? I asked. Did what just happen? The divorce. It's been two years, eleven months, but we've been separated for close to four years now, Dad said. Something in his tone told me he probably knew the precise number of days, too. Maybe even minutes and seconds. Dad was like that. The doctors said you weren't sure of the year before, but... Well, do you think this is part of the same thing? I didn't answer him. For the first time, I allowed the possibility that I had forgotten everything in the last four years. I tried to remember the last thing I could remember. This turned out to be an incredibly difficult task because your brain is constantly creating new memories. What came to mind was uselessly recent, my blood on James's collar. I decided to make a more specific request of my brain. I tried to remember the last thing I could about my mother. What came to me was her Sign of the Times show, which was an exhibition of her photography at a Brooklyn gallery. She picked me up on the last day of sixth grade so she could give me a private showing before anyone else got there. The show had consisted of pictures of signs from around the country and the world. Street, traffic, restaurant, township, movie theater, bathrooms, signs that were painted over but you could still make them out, signs that were homemade by homeless people or hitchhikers, etc. Mom had this theory you could tell everything about people and civilization in general from the kinds of signs they put up. For example, one of her favorite pictures was of a mostly rusted sign out in some backwoods area. The sign read, No dogs, N-words, or Mexicans. She said that, regardless of the rest, it had communicated to her clear as anything to, and I quote, Take the picture and get the hell out of town. Most of her exhibit was more boring than that, though. As we were leaving, I told her I was proud of her, because that's what my parents always said to me whenever they came to see my dance recital or attend a school open house. Mom replied that she was, quote, proud of herself, too. I could remember her smiling just before she started to cry. So is Mom on her way, then? I asked Dad. I didn't think you'd want her here. I told him that she was my mother, so of course I wanted her. The thing is, Dad cleared his throat before continuing. I have called her, but since you haven't really spoken to each other for a while, it didn't seem right for her to come. Dad furrowed his brow. I noticed that he had less hair on his head than my brain was telling me he ought to have. Do you want me to call her back? I did. I longed for mom in a primitive way, but I didn't want to seem like a baby or not like myself, whatever that meant. Mom and I not speaking? It seemed so unbelievable to me and like more than I could ever even begin to figure out in my current state. I needed time to think. I told dad he didn't need to call mom and his brow unfurrowed a wrinkle or two. Well, that's what I thought, he said. About a minute later, Dad clapped his hands together before taking out a pad and pencil out of his back pocket. He always carried them in case he became inspired. You should make a list of everything you don't remember, he said, holding the pencil out to me. Although my dad writes mainly books for a living, what he loves writing most are lists. Groceries, books he's read, people he's angry at, the list goes on. If he could write lists for money instead of books, I think he'd be a happier person overall. 
I once said that to him, in fact, and he laughed before replying, Well, what do you think a table of contents is, kid? A book is just a very detailed and elaborate list. My father's a My father is one of those people who believes that anything can be accomplished. The ills of the world cured, so long as it's written down and assigned a number. Maybe it's genetic, because I am most definitely not one of those people. So how about it? Dad was still holding the pencil out to me. If I can't remember it in the first place, how will I remember to put it on the list? I asked. It was the most absurd thing in a day full of absurd things, as ridiculous as asking a person who's lost her keys where she last saw them. Oh, good point. Dad tapped his head with his pencil. Brain's still working better than your old man's, I see. How about you hear things you don't remember? You tell me, and I write them down for you. I shrugged. At least it would keep Dad occupied. Things Naomi has forgotten. He said as he wrote, Number one, Cass is in Dad's divorce. He held up the paper to show me. Just seeing it written down, doesn't that make it a little less frightening? It did not. Number two, he continued, Everything after Cass is in my divorce. So that would be 2001, right? I don't know. I knew Dad was trying to be helpful, but... He was really starting to annoy the crap out of me. Number 10. Your boyfriend, I'm assuming. I have a boyfriend? I thought of what James had said. Dad looked at me. Ace. He's still away at tennis camp. He made a note. Dad was up to 19. Driver's ed? No. Driving? Maybe. When a nurse came into the room to wheel me away from my first of many tests, I remember feeling relieved that I didn't have to hear number 20. I was in the hospital for three more nights. A rotation coven of evil nurses would wake me up every three hours or so by shining a flashlight in my eyes. This is what they do when you've had head trauma. All you want is sleep and no one will let you. Besides not sleeping, the rest of my time was occupied with taking boring tests ignoring my father's incessant list-making and wondering if James Larkin might take it upon himself to visit. He didn't. My first visitor was Will Landsman. Visiting hours began at 11 o'clock on Fridays, and Will showed up at 10.54. My dad had gone outside to make a few calls, so there was no one around to even tell me who this teenage boy in a maroon smoking jacket was. Nice save, Ace! Will said as he entered the room. I asked him what he meant and he explained that my rescue of the yearbook camera. Not a scratch on it. Really going above and beyond for the Call of Duty out there. Despite his questionable clothing choices, Will was not the least bit fussy or wimpy. When I asked him about the jacket, he claimed that he wears it ironically. As a way to entertain myself in the face of daily monotony of school uniforms. He was compactly built, about my height, 5 feet 7 inches, but solid looking. He had wavy chestnut hair and dark blue eyes, sapphire or cerulean, a deeper shade than either mine or my mother's. His eyelashes were very long and looked as if they had been coated in mascara, even though they hadn't been. On that day, he had a light, dark circle under his eye, and his cheeks were flushed. If he seemed loud or cavalier about my incident, I suspected now that it was his way of masking his concern for me. In any case, I liked him immediately. He felt comfortable, broken in like favorite jeans. It probably goes without saying that James had the opposite effect on me in the brief time I had known him. Are you ace? I asked, remembering what Dad had said about me having a boyfriend. Will removed his black rectangular frames and wiped them on his pants. I would later learn that removing his glasses was something Will did when he was embarrassed, as if not seeing something clearly could in some way distance him from an awkward situation. No, I am most definitely not, he said. Ace is about six inches taller than me, and he's also your boyfriend. A second later, Will's eyes flashed something mischievous. 
Okay, so this is deeply wrong. I want it on the record that you are acknowledging that this is deeply wrong before I even say it. Fine, it's wrong, I said. Deeply. Okay, deeply wrong. Good, Will nodded. I feel much better knowing that you don't remember him either. By the by, your man's adult not to come. <laughs> adult? Who used dolt? Tool, no offense. Leave. Right now, I said in a mock stern tone, you've gone too far insulting Ace. What's his last name? Zuckerman. Right, Zuckerman. Yeah, I'm really outraged that you insulted my boyfriend I don't remember anyway. You might be later, and if that's the case, I take it all back. Visiting hours only started a minute ago, so he'll probably still come. Will said, as a way of encouraging me, I suppose. Dad said that he was still at tennis camp? Hmm. <laughs> if it were my girlfriend, I would come back from tennis camp. Who's your girlfriend? I asked. I don't have one. I was speaking hypothetically. Will chuckled and then stuck his hand out for me to shake. Introductions are in order. I am William Landsman, the co-editor of The Phoenix. Incidentally, you're the other co-editor. Your dad said you might have forgotten some things, but I didn't think it was possible I might be one of them. Are you that memorable? Pretty much, yes. He nodded decisively. And humble. I didn't need to remember him to know exactly how to tease him. And also your best friend, if you haven't already figured that out. Will cleaned his glasses again. Really? My best friend wears a smoking jacket, I nodded. That's very interesting. It's ironic. Seriously, though, you can ask me anything. Honest to God, Chief, I know everything about you. I looked in his eyes and decided to trust him. How does my face look? Since they'd stitch up my forehead, I'd basically been trying to avoid my reflection. He examined me from both sides, then from the front. A little swollen around your left eye and cheekbone, but most of it's covered by tape and gauze. Look under the gauze, will you? Chief, I am not looking under the gauze for you. It's completely unsanitary and against the rules. Do you want me to get kicked out of here and not be able to visit you? I want a report before I have to see it for myself. I want to know if I'm, like, disfigured. I tried to say it casually, but I was scared. Please, Will. It's important. Will sighed heavily before grumbling. I said I'd tell you anything, not that I'd do anything. I want it on record that I, William Landsman, did not want to do this, and I'm furthermore not trained for medical procedure. He went into my room's dollhouse, W.C., and washed his hands before returning to my bedside. He placed his left hand gently on the right side of my face before using his right hand to slowly remove the section of surgical tape from the left side of my hairline. Tell me if I'm hurting you, even a little. I nodded. When one of my hairs pulled on the tape, I winced in what I thought was an imperceptible move, and Will stopped. Am I hurting you? I shook my head. Go on. Ten seconds later, he had removed enough tape so that he could lift up the gauze and look under it. There are nine stitches and a raised knob right below that. Possibly the size of a Brussels sprout and a larger bruise spread out across your forehead. None of it looks permanent. You'll probably have a tiny scar from the stitches. He refastened the gauze as delicately as he had removed them. You are still insanely, unfairly, torturously beautiful. And that's all the last I'm going to say about it, Chief. Thank you, I said. You are welcome, he said jauntily. Glad to be of service, he tipped an imaginary hat. Don't think I'm unaware that you were really fishing for compliments. Yep, you see right through me, I said. Will leaned in close and whispered. Come on, admit it. You really do remember me. All this amnesia crap is just so you could take a break from the phoenix. How'd you know? 
I just didn't want to hurt your feelings, landsman. That's really considerate of you. So what's my boyfriend like? I asked him. Let's see. Ace Zuckerman is an awful good tennis player. You're saying you don't like him? As he's not my boyfriend, I don't think I'm technically required to, chief. What about James Larkin? James Larkin. Larkin, comma, James. Yeah, we haven't really met him yet. He's new this year, which is unusual for a senior. I think he might have gotten kicked out of his last school or something. A delinquent? That was interesting. Will shrugged. I only met him this morning when he dropped off the camera at the Phoenix, and he was polite as anything. FYI, that kid is nothing like Ace Zuckerman. He paused. Or me. He reached into his messenger bag and pulled out his laptop. You have your headphones with you, right? I shook my head. I'm not sure. You always do. Where's your bag? I pointed to the closet in the corner of the room. Will opened the door and started digging around my backpack, which probably should have bothered me, but it didn't. It seemed like someone else's bag anyway. He pulled out an iPod, presumably mine, and plugged it into his laptop. When I heard from your dad, I decided to make you a mix. Don't worry, I burned it for you too. He handed me a CD and a playlist entitled Songs for a Teenage Amnesiac, Volume 1. It's not my best. Some of the sections are a little broad, he continued. But I was under time constraints. I promise Volume 2 will be better. As it is with, for example, the second record of the Beatles' White Album or the Godfather movies. Will handed me my headphones and put away his laptop. He started speaking really fast. It's hard to make a good mix. You don't want anything too cliche, but you also don't want songs that are too obscure either. Plus, they have to be a good fit for about 19 tracks on a song. And you want each of them to say something different. And you want a balance of slow and fast. And then there's the added pressure of making sure you keep tracks organically leading from one to the next. Plus, you've got to know the person for whom the mix is intended really well. For example, on yours, each of the songs means something. For the first one, is sort of like how we met freshman year. I thought it might jog a memory of yours. I read the CD liner. Fight Test by the Flaming Lips. Yeah, I was on the fence between that and Yoshimi's Battle of the Pink Robots, Part 1. And also, To Whom It May Concern, by John Wesley Harding. I eliminated the first one because I had another of his songs, and I wanted to use it. And it's bad to duplicate artists. The one I had instead is called Song I Wrote Myself in the Future, and it's the next to last track. I was about to ask him how we had met, but I was interrupted by the arrival of someone who made me forget about the mix and William Landsman for the first time. Hi, Mrs. Miles, Will said to my mother. Hello there, she replied uncertainly. Will laughed. We've never met before, but I've seen your pictures. I am William Landsman, Will. Can you give us a moment alone? My mother asked Will. Will looked at me. You'll be okay? I nodded. I should be getting back to your book anyway, Will said. There's your book in summer? I asked. It never quits. He took my hand in his and shook it rather formally. I'll call you, he promised. Don't forget to charge up your cell phone. After Will closed the door, neither my mother nor I spoke. My mother is beautiful, and since some adopted, you know I'm not saying that as some sort of backhanded compliment or way of telling you how pretty I am. Besides, everyone says so. And she isn't beautiful in one of those cliched kind of ways. She's not tall and skinny and blonde with big boobs or something. She's little and curvy with wavy brown hair halfway down her back and almond-shaped ice blue eyes. It felt like I hadn't seen her in forever. I almost started to cry, but something kept me from doing it. Mom, however, did not hold back. She burst into tears almost as soon as she got to my bedside. I told myself I wasn't going to do that, she said. 
She mock slapped herself across the face before taking my hand. Where were you? I asked. Your dad told me not to come, that you didn't want me. But how could I not come? She looked at my face. Your poor head. She ever so gently stroked over my brow and then leaned over to hug me. I pulled away. I needed to know a few things first. You and dad are divorced. She nodded. But why? Dad came into the room then. His voice was hard as bricks. Yes, tell her, Cass. I can explain. Her eyes started to tear again. You were 12 when I ran into Nigel. It was just by chance. Who's Nigel? Her high school boyfriend. Dad answered for her. Just by chance, Mom repeated. I was waiting for the subway and it was the most random thing in the whole world. I told her I didn't want a story. Only facts. I... She began again. This is so hard. I told her I didn't want adjectives and adverbs, only nouns and verbs. I asked her if she could handle that. She nodded and cleared her throat. I had an affair, she said. I got pregnant, she said. Your dad and I got divorced, she said. I married Nigel and moved back to the city. You have a three-year-old sister. Sister? It was a foreign word on my tongue. Gibberish. Sisters were something other people had, like monos and ponies. But I, I thought you couldn't have children, I said. Dad whispered to my mother something about how he had been trying to break this to me slowly. How he had already been through a lot. He never mentioned a sister or my mom's pregnancy, which seemed odd considering all the list making. I wondered what else he'd been holding back. Sister, I repeated. It felt even more made up the second time. Yes, her name is Chloe. Are we close? I asked. No, Mom said. You refused to see her. I couldn't think of anything to say. It's probably a lot to hear all at once, Dad said. How are you feeling, Cupcake? Her voice was high and whispery. She sounded like she was floating away. How do I feel? About what? Which part? Everything. Everything I've told you, I suppose. What I felt was that all of these were very good reasons for us not to be speaking. It was one thing for mom and dad to have gotten divorced, but for mom to get together with her high school boyfriend and have an affair and a daughter and a whole new family? I feel like... Her eyes were wide and expectant. I honestly feel repulsed. I honestly feel like you're a slut. Naomi, Dad said. What? I asked. She is. Women who cheat on their husbands and get pregnant are sluts. Why didn't you add that to your list, Dad? Mom stood up and started to back away from my bed, not quite able to look me in the eye. I I understand, she said. I understand. I understand. Finally, Dad said that he thought that maybe she should go. Which was funny because she seemed to be heading in that direction already. What happened to the wandering porters? I asked after Mom left. They wander no more. Dad tried to make a joke out of it. The last book was Iceland. Do you remember that summer that we went to Iceland? I did. We had left right after Mom's show, which may have even made it my last memory. I was 12, and it had been pretty much 50 degrees all summer long, the coldest summer of my life. My mom and I used to say it was the summer without any summer. What do you do now? I asked. Your mom still takes pictures, so I still write books. We just don't do it together. The wandering porters are still in print, mostly. What are your new books about? Um, well, the last one was about, I'm not good at describing, it was about a lot of things, Dad said, but the jacket said it was about 
The end of my marriage is seen through the wider prism of world events. I interpreted. It's about the divorce. Basically, you could say that, yes. I asked him if I had liked it. He said I hadn't read it, but that the reviews were pretty decent. Maybe I should read it now, I said, if my memory doesn't come back. Yeah, you should just skip through the parts about the Middle East, Dad suggested. There's quite a bit about that, too. Not that you shouldn't be informed, but even I think it gets a little dry. Naomi, are you are you crying? Oh, I guess I was. I'm sorry, I said. I turned around to my side, away from my dad. I didn't want him to watch me cry. In all likelihood, the reason he hadn't told me about Mom and Chloe was because he hadn't wanted to discuss it himself. Whenever Dad said anything serious, he would usually undercut it with a joke. That was his style. When he and my mom used to throw parties, he was always the funny storyteller and could make everyone else laugh. My dad certainly wasn't what anyone would call shy, and yet he was. By himself, he was always a bit stingy with certain things. Like, he rarely said, I love you. I knew he did love me, but he just didn't say it a whole lot. My mom was the one with all the, I love yous. But I understood what dad was like, because I was like that too. This was why I couldn't look at him. Why are you crying, kiddo? What's in your head? The doctors had told us that people with head injuries could be emotional, but it wasn't that, it was just... Everything. It wasn't entirely your mother's fault. Mainly hers, but Dad laughed. I'm kidding, mostly. I felt so alone. What is it? Please, tell your old man. I feel like an orphan. I was sobbing to the point that my dad couldn't understand me the first time and I had to repeat myself. I'm an orphan. Probably wouldn't make any sense, but it was like my mother was less like my mother than she had been before. Or maybe that I was just less her child now that she had a brand new one. I was a vestigial daughter, an obsolete girl with an obsolete brain and an obsolete heart. I could hear my dad's breathing, but he didn't say anything, and I just couldn't bear to look at him. I closed my eyes. Naomi, dad said after a while. Are you sleeping? I kept my eyes closed and let him think that I was. He kissed me on the forehead. I will never leave you, kid. He wouldn't have said that if he thought I was awake.